hello and welcome back to my channel how are you doing we're now day 638 at least of quarantine so I hope you're not going mad I've been able to create and get to be very crafty doing DIY sewing and it's been a really fantastic time for me to be in my house and just go through my box of bits and bobs to do a little something about me is that I'm a costumer by trade so that means I get to research into history, creating these characters. I want to know who they were and where they come from. Now, I thought that'd be a really interesting series to do. What happens if I researched a period of history and a period of fashion and took that and created something modern? Also, I'm feeling very inspired by the 18th century at the moment as we plan to go to a ball in Versailles. And created something modern that we can wear nowadays either from fabric or the cut of something. So let's delve into this world of chintz fabric and how we can create that into a fantastic summer look that you can wear. While looking for fabric for my own garment, I stumbled upon this beautiful piece of fabric. It is so luxurious for me. I think it's the perfect summer fabric. I think it's got beautiful flowers because it's we're currently in spring at the moment as well. This fabric would be the perfect chance for me to use a pattern that's been in my pattern books for quite some time. This little dungaree set is what I intend to create. I think it would be cute, I think it would be fun. I can imagine myself walking through the Loire Valley wearing this. Let's talk a little bit about chintz fabric and where it comes from in the heritage. Chintz fabric originated in India, some suggesting as early as the 1480s. The name comes from the Hindu word chint, which means spotted, speckled or sprayed, which really hits the nail on the head of the style of fabric. The fabric was created with the use of a calico textiles and then by taking a wood block with a pattern carved into it, they would begin the printing process by hand, stamping the calico until it was covered with an array of colour and detailed flower patterns. Today you will see chintz a lot in your grandmother's cushioning, wallpaper and not to forget when it's tea time you will find many chintz pottery pieces. You may also recognise chintz mostly being used in the 18th century in a lot of day wares. It was used a lot in Dutch fabric as the Portuguese and the Dutch were trading from the 1600s to the 1800s bring the Indian chintz back to Europe. In my research I have discovered many maid servants that looked to be Dutch wearing chintz garments as chintz was first used as curtains, beddings and other furniture pieces. Then once these pieces were finished and they needed to be replaced they would pass the fabrics down to the maid servants. But the jokes on them because I think they look fantastic. Once the popularity was growing you could find chintz fabric being supplied with the English and French merchants. When I think of the style, I've always thought of French fashion in mind. A beautiful white, red and blue flowered chintz pattern on a robe de les Anglais with a lady walking in the gardens of Versailles. Some of the best examples of chintz fabric I've seen in my life is Provence in the south of France, where each piece of chintz fabric looked like a blossom with its beautiful muted pinks, blues and yellows. It felt like a sweet dessert. I have also recently discovered that there were chintz kimonos. They were made by the Dutch traders when they were looking for another way to supply more kimonos to Europe. It really was everywhere. But by the late 17th century, the mills in France and England were concerned about not having the skills to recreate the chintz that was imported from India. So that being said, they declared a ban on chintz imports. With the actual laws in place forbidding the ability to wear it, but there were loopholes in the law which allowed the Court of Versailles, which technically was outside the jurisdictions of the law, were allowed to wear chintz still. But you know, that's probably another aspect to why the French Revolution happened. Maybe a teeny tiny aspect. But luckily the ban was lifted in 1759 as there were people researching in India on how to make chintz and then would send samples back to Europe, which allowed the mills in France and England to produce chintz in their own fashion, of course. Another example of Europe trying to reproduce Indian fabrics was by creating Toile de Jol, which is a video for later on. Now coming back to the project at hand, I bought this 
online. It's a 100% cotton. As I said before, it's used a lot by um, quilters. So it's a perfect fabric to use. It'll be soft. It is fantastic for air to get through. Now, when purchasing the fabric for this garment itself, I suggest purchasing around four meters. It says on the pattern that you need about three and a half, depending on the width. But I always like to give myself a little bit more just in case you don't know what will happen. You always set yourself up for emergencies. And maybe I could cover a button or something. You just don't know. It's always nice to be safe and then sorry. Now, after purchasing this fabric, I do suggest washing it. It's always best to wash fabrics, depending on the fabric, but with cotton, you're safe. Wash the fabric, then it'll get rid of anything that's not natural in it. It also will help the fabric, because sometimes with fabrics, they do shrink if you don't wash the fabric, so it's best to pre-shrink it. So now that it's washed, I'm going to give it a wee steam on the iron, and then start cutting the fabric. So I hope you enjoyed that montage of fabric cutting. Of course, the most important thing I forgot to mention before you do any fabric cutting, any sewing whatsoever, is watch a really good TV series. I'm not sure if I'll be watching Midsummer Murders, which is a classic, love it, or community that's just come out on Netflix. Thank God for Netflix. So should I do a wee poll on Instagram to see what the vote's gonna be? Let's go check that out. Now, interesting thing about this is, do I pattern match it or not? Um, the more I look at it, the more I'm confused about how the pattern goes. Do we cut the pattern like this? Do we cut the pattern like this? I think the more I've looked at it, I think I'm going to have the pattern going down this way, following this feature, because that seems to be the more prominent flowers because then you've got this so I think for this you don't necessarily need to pattern match it but I will be doing a pocket on the front which will be like this so I'm gonna make sure that the pocket and the bib front are in a really beautiful patch of flowers and maybe we could like have the pocket like more flowers coming out of the pocket so I think that's the best way to do it When laying down the pattern pieces on the fabric, follow the grain. There will be indicators on the pattern that allows you to do this. For this fabric, I was lucky that the grain goes up and down, which meant that I was able to follow the fabric pattern the way I wanted it to go. Then chop, chop, chop. Follow those pattern lines that you want. decided to work with the fabric facing up so I could have perfect placement, especially in regards to the bib, then I knew exactly where all the floral display was going to be situated. That meant I could easily follow the pocket guide to match up the fabrics of the pocket and the bib. I was able to be able to pattern match the pocket piece to the bib by the use of using pins. I put a pin on each important corner that was located on the bib front, that way I could transfer the pattern over and have exactly the same style. That meant by doing this, it was exactly the same on the bib and on the pocket, making it seamless. Now let's cut out that perfectly matched pocket piece. So now that I've cut out all my pieces, I need to fuse a couple of the pieces with some interfacing. I like to use Stay Flex. I find it more durable than the average. It's very soft, so it still has movement with the fabric, but it's also quite good. Um, I got this at Shepherd's Bush, but you're able to buy it from different places. I find Whaley's, which I will link below, has a very good Stay Flex. 
person, you only need to get the bib, the pocket, and the waistbands to be interfaced. It really depends on your iron and your fabric and your stay flex how you press it on, but always be gentle with the heat so you don't melt the stay flex. So that is the worst thing you can have. So with these pieces, I just needed to stay flex the pockets, the bib, the waistband and the straps, so not too much. I'm going to now move on to creating the garment itself. Now this is a beautiful layout. It is such fantastic written instructions. I haven't seen anything quite like this for some time. I think this is a good brand to use if you're new to sewing. And I think this is gonna be a really simple project. Now, normally speaking, you would start off with the trousers, sew those, and then continue up. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna prep everything. So I'm gonna pin what needs to be pinned for the trousers and do pockets. And I think what's most important for me uh, because it's getting later in the day and I don't want to be tired when I'm doing the more difficult stuff is that I'm going to work on the bib. By taking your pocket you're going to work out what you need to do. Now this is when it's best to have an iron and a sewing machine at handy. You see this? This is the fold line so you want to recreate that on this. It is best to use a ruler and a pen. Now grabbing your pocket you want to be able to recreate this fold line here. Now, a little trick I like to use is an, a pen that is a heat pen. Once you draw onto it, you'll be able to get rid of it with heat. Now, if you're very worried that there will be a mark on this, I suggest turning it over and working from there. But I'm going to give this a test to see how it goes with the fabric. So I forgot to mention that I actually cut out two pieces of this. So my intention is to create a bagging out situation. So it's like a lining. So I'm going to pocket out this pocket and then I'm going to sew around these three edges, leave this open so I can flip it through and then we will create the seam again that we've created because once I fold it, it'll be nice to have a nice little stitch line and make it a nice clean edge. Now the seam allowance for this is 1.5. So I'll be sewing 1.3, just a little bit under 1.5 centimeters around this, so there's still space to bag it out and iron it. Now that you've sewn 1.5 around your edges, you want to clean the edges out, so there's not a lot of bulk inside the fabric. So I like to personally cut about three mil away. So by grabbing your scissors, Carefully. Ooh. So it's as clean as possible, and you do this on all sides. Once this is completed, you want to bag out the piece. I personally like to use my snips, but gently to be able to poke out the edges so you get a nice crisp corner. We will press this out so we can start to create this line. So now that we've got a nice crisp line with our folding, we're going to pin it down and then tuck the excess fabric in so we can hide it then be able to do a nice little top stitch over the top creating a really nice strong line. Now I've decided to make mine two centimeters. happy 
happy with this. It looks very seamless. It looks like an extension of the fabric. I found in the past that if you use a scrap of fabric at these points here, on the flip side, will make it more durable and stronger. If you don't understand what I mean, I'm trying to create pit points that are strong and do not rip the fabric if we put strong, heavy materials inside of our pocket. So if you ignore the spoilers amidst some murders there, we're going to bag out the bib front. It is best to sew down three sides, leaving the bottom seam open. If we leave the bottom open, that means we'll be able to bag it out and then have all the excess fabric hidden on the inside when we put on the waistband. And then snip, 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 make that seam thin. Now that we've sewn the waistband together, we're going to fold it in half so we can put the notches in where the bib front is going to be attached to it. Align the bib with the notches and then pin it on. It is now officially time to work on the trousers. We're going to take the front pocket and the front trousers and match up the seams perfectly at the top and on the side and we're going to pin it down. We will then repeat this on the other side. We flip over and do the backs, matching each pocket to the back pieces. Once you've sewn it, you've got to press, press, press and make that seam nice and flat. And then I personally like to top stitch the front pocket down so it's a nice crisp edge. Okay, it is now time to connect the front and the back together. Start by matching all the seams up together as well as the notches, which I'm doing here on the pattern. This way you'll know where the stitches need to go down to on either side. pin all the way down the outside leg and the inside leg. Now, then stitch stitch the outside leg, the inside leg and including the pocket up to the notches where they were marked. I'm going to start my day by overlocking everything and when I say everything I mean everything apparently while doing this I decided to stuff my face full of chocolate so I had to put an emoji over it because I couldn't stand watching my face edit but what we're going to do is do the trousers we're going to turn one leg inside out and then bagged it through attaching the crotch then ensure you stop the pinning of the crotch where the notches say at the back seam so you can insert the zipper later on. It's time for the zipper. So we're going to attach the zipper like this. <laughs> so attach one side this way and I like to pin right along the zipper so I can get a clear understanding where it goes and then we stitch it down using a zipper foot. Make sure it's not on the zipper line but quite close to it because you want to have it nice and crisp and hide the zipper as much as possible. For this pattern I've decided to have a little lip over the zipper so the zipper is hidden because I'm not a huge fan of seeing it and also I'm using a normal zipper instead of an invisible zipper because I want it to be strong because it's the back seam. So I'm just rearranging it so it fits it on perfectly. Sometimes you may pin it on, but you need to start again at the bottom to make sure the zipper sits flush. Then I'll be top stitching it over so it's nice and secure, but still having the lip and that it means that it's hidden. Find 
little tip here is that I like to use a pair of snips to help guide me with the foot along the zipper because my zipper foot isn't great. I've, I need to invest in a new one, I think. But this gives me more of a guide and I can, I can now get a crisp stitch by doing this little technique. Now it's time to do a gather stitch by making a large stitch using your size six or the largest one that you have we're going to stitch the top line, allowing it to get a nice little loose gather going. Make sure you go all the way along. I decided to have a little space in between the seams so I could use it more as an anchor and pull at multiple sides instead of just pulling at one end or the other. Make sure you leave a nice long stitch so you can pull it later on. And then it's time to go over again, creating a second seam or a second channel, you could say. So you have more control over the gather. All right, so now time for the straps. We're gonna fold our strap in half and then pin all the way down along the outside edge. it's time to sew it. Make sure you close up the straight edge at the bottom. Using my handy dandy stick or any other way means that you use to be able to turn it inside out we're going to push it through to the other side so we get the top fabric finally looking outside of the strap. And then I like to do a little bit of a push in the corners with my bizarre broken bent stick. <laughs> Ah, it's sitting now flush. Press, 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 make that strap nice and flat. Ooh, again, a bit of top stitching. Gosh, I love to top stitch. To me, it's very crisp. You don't have to do this, but I personally just love it. It's now time to attach the straps to the waistband. By using the pattern piece, we're going to mark in the notches again using a pin. Once this is done, attach the strap that had the little slanty section onto the waistband that matches perfectly in between the two notches. And then stitch both sides down. Now that we've done those pieces to the waistband, we're going to attach the other half of the waistband. Make sure you line it perfectly with the side seams and the centre front. Then we're going to stitch that down. It's going to be a way to encase the straps and the bib so it has a nice clean edge. Oh, it's now starting to look like the pattern. How exciting. Now it's officially time to attach the trousers to the waistband. So to make sure that it all sits perfectly, you wanna gather the trousers in to match the center front and the side seams. So I always like to start at the center front, then attach the side seams, and then work my way to make sure the fabric fits perfectly in between. Once you've stitched the trousers to the waistband, you're going to encase all the seam allowance and hide it. That is achieved by using the other side of the waistband to be able to tuck it over. I think we all know how I feel about top stitching now. I like to stitch in the ditch for this or I can top stitch about 5 mil away from the seam allowance so it's all encased together and nothing will budge. Then I also top stitched the top of the waistband just to be uniform with the straps. Now it's time for the buttons. I couldn't decide between the two, but I think I chose the right one. The pattern will have a guide on where to place the buttons. So I took that as a rough estimate and then I worked within 
the parameters of the fabric because they were quite large buttons. Then I measured two centimeters from each corner so I could find a nice midway point for the button to sit perfectly flush on the bib. You stitch that button really strongly down, then you twist the thread around to give it a nice secure base. I actually learned this from the Opera House in Australia. So thankful that's one of the best techniques I learned about sewing in my career. When I say Opera House in Australia, I mean Opera Australia. That does shows at the Sydney Opera House. It gets very confusing after a while, I know. <laughs> okay, so now we need to make those buttonholes. So the way I like to do it is that I like to follow the guide that the pattern has given us. And then I put little pins to denote where the end's gonna be and where the center is gonna be or the fabric. This way you get a bit of a sense of where it needs to be. But depending on the button, you need to adjust the sizes for each button. Now regarding the hems, you can do the way that you desire. You can either just turn up the seam and be happy with that. Or you could just do a little trouser tuck. Depends on the style you feel like. since I filmed the ending of this vlog and we still need an ending for the vlog. As much as I want to say, like my video because it really supports my channel, to subscribe, I don't know if this is the best time to say this because a lot has happened this week in the world and it needs to be addressed. I've got my notes and I want to say a few things about what's happening in the world. Well, clearly the ball in Versailles did not happen. This very week I was meant to be there and we're not there. <laughs> So I've been able to do other things around the house instead of working on my costume, which I still need to finish before we go back to work. But in the same week I was meant to be having a lovely holiday, a lot of changes happened in the world. I hope that all the protesters are safe as they are taking this monumental step into history to change what is going around. They are going to change the world because this abuse towards black lives should never happen again. Seeing stories that are coming up is breaking my heart and you imagine them being in the past but unfortunately they are today and they were yesterday and they are probably still going to be the future so we need to make sure we do everything we can to support and fight this horrific experience because I will never understand what it feels like and we have to do everything we can to give a new lease of life to people that shouldn't have to change or watch their behaviors as they walk down the street doing a simple task so i've linked a video below explaining a lot of what's going on it's very interesting and it gives you some good facts happening of all sides from peaceful protests to other bits and bobs which i found very fascinating i'll also link another video which if you can't donate if you watch this whole video with all the ads that and that money that's being made from this youtube video will go to charities that will help support the black movement cause. I want to end on a really sad note, but she was never a sad person. She was fabulous. Unfortunately, I lost my friend to cancer this week and she fought it to the very, very end and she was extraordinary. <laughs> she was so supportive of me, even in her last weeks of life. She didn't care about talking about herself. She wanted to tell me, that she loved my videos and what a beautiful distraction I was creating for her and she was smiling so so with this video I thought about her the whole way that I edited through I was trying to make a video that would make her smile have a little bit of cheek and a little bit of knowledge and just make her really proud so my darling lady you have no idea the impact you made on the people around you I'm seeing messages every day of so much love towards you. I really hope that you knew how much you were loved and admired in this lifetime. So, all well, that being said, hold on to the people you love as close as possible and fight for the people that need change. <laughs>